In this lecture, we will cover the basics of skeletal muscle structure and begin to introduce some of the functional characteristics. We'll be covering an organization of skeletal muscle, how contraction and relaxation occurs, how muscles produce ATP, the mechanics of skeletal muscle, types of skeletal muscle fibers, cardiac muscle and smooth muscle, as well as some of the properties of muscle regeneration as we go through the series of lectures. Let's begin and let's start with talking about the three types of muscles and their function. In our bodies there are three primary types of muscle, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. These Muscle types all share some characteristics, but they all have some individual differences. Skeletal muscle cells are long and thick compared to cardiac muscle cells and smooth muscle cells. And one of the defining characteristics of skeletal muscle cells is that under investigation under a microscope, you will notice striations or stripes that go across the width of the muscle cells. When I say that they're long, skeletal muscle cells can be as short as a few millimeters or as long as perhaps a couple of feet. Uh, the cells will span from tendon attachment to tendon attachment, and if you think about the length, say, for example, of the human thigh, skeletal muscle cells can be longer than a foot long. And the thickness of a skeletal muscle cell, well, thin by our normal world standards, they're about as thick as a human hair, are thick compared to other muscle cells which are perhaps half that size or less in diameter. So skeletal muscle cells can be about 100 microns in diameter and other muscle, other cells in general and muscle cells as well in cardiac and smooth muscle probably only 40 or 50 microns at the most in diameter. Skeletal muscle cells, as I said, are striated. Striated just means that they have stripes going across them, and so are cardiac muscle cells. And if you look closely at this image that's provided for cardiac muscle, you can see that there are cross striations in the cardiac muscle cells as well. Skeletal muscle cells are attached to our skeleton, and because of those attachments, they can move our limbs, and they power the movements that re are required for speech, and movements of the eye, they're under voluntary control. Both cardiac and smooth muscle are involuntary muscles and that means that they're controlled by the autonomic nervous systems or by internal pacemakers that regulate their contractions and relaxations. We do not actively control our heartbeat or the movements of smooth muscles. Cardiac muscle cells are found only in the heart Smooth muscle cells are found in various places associated with hollow internal organs such as arteries. Uh, there are, they are the muscles of the stomach, they are the muscles of the uterus, they are the muscles of the respiratory system and the digestive tract. Smooth muscle cells are called smooth muscles because they are not striated. That is, when you examine them under the microscope, you do not see clear cross striations. And that tells you that there's something different about the proteins in smooth muscle cells and how they're organized when you compare them to cardiac muscle or skeletal muscle. Cardiac muscle cells are relatively short, but they can be branched. And rather than connecting to a bone as skeletal muscle, they connect to other cardiac muscle cells at a structure called the intercalated disc. The intercalated disc is a dense protein. So skeletal muscles produce our body movements. They produce the um, movements that also allow us to stabilize joints. If you, say, are handing someone a book but they don't take it right away and you hold that position, that's because your skeletal muscles are allowing you to stabilize the joint and hold that position. They are the muscles that help you to keep your neck upright and to sit upright. And as skeletal muscles contract, they can generate heat. This shows attachments of skeletal muscles uh, to the skeletal system, and it's a classic example using the biceps and triceps. 
in many cases what you will find is that skeletal muscles are arranged on the opposite sides of a joint so, so they can control the movement of the joint to move limbs closer together or move limbs further apart. So with the biceps, when it contracts and the triceps is relaxed, you move the forearm towards the arm and shorten the angle between the forearm and the arm when the biceps contracts. If you do, this is called a flexion. If you do the opposite action, where the triceps contracts and the biceps remains relaxed, then you get an extension, and that is that the forearm, the forearm here moves away from the arm proper. Now, this and this angle at the elbow joint becomes larger. Notice though that when the triceps contracts, the biceps relaxes and is stretched by the contraction of the triceps, and the same is true when the biceps contracts that the movement of the biceps will cause a stretch of the triceps. So there is this resetting of the length of the biceps so that now it's been stretched and it can contract again uh, after the triceps has contracted. And the opposite is true when you reverse the action of the extension by doing a flexion. Skeletal muscle cells are called excitable cells because just like neurons, they can fire action potentials. Skeletal muscle cells have contractility. Contractility means that they can either generate force or they can shorten when they are stimulated. And skeletal muscles are extensible as we just showed in the previous slide. That is, if you stretch a relaxed muscle, it stretches the tissue without damaging the tissue. This diagram shows the beginnings of the organization of skeletal muscle. That is, if you look at the attachment to the bone, you have an at a tendon, and these tendon fibers will then attach to the ends of the muscle cells. And this whole muscle is wrapped in a sheath of connective tissue, and within the whole muscle you find smaller bundles called fascicles, and the fascicles are also wrapped in a sheet of connective tissue and the entire whole muscle is filled with these fascicles. Within each fascicle, you find individual muscle fibers, the individual cells, and each one of them also has a sheath of connective tissue. And that connective tissue runs to the ends of the fiber at both ends and connects to the tendon attachments. Also, if you look at this diagram, you can see a vein in blue between the fascicles a artery in red between the fascicles, and shown in yellow or gold here, is a nerve bundle. So the nerves and the blood vessels will move between the fascicles, penetrating the fascicles when uh, they need to access the tissue for, either, for nervous system control or for pro providing um, nutrition or removing waste. So fascicles contain muscle fibers. Let's take a look at muscle fibers. Here this shows the cross striations of muscle fibers in the light microscope. Another thing to notice inside an individual muscle fiber, there's more than one nucleus. Muscle fibers are formed during development by the fusion of small cells called myoblasts, and the fusion of these myoblasts results in the accumulation of nuclei as the cell becomes larger and larger until it reaches its full mature length. So here in this corner we show some myoblasts, the myoblasts fuse, they form an immature muscle cell and the fusion of these continued fusion of myoblasts into the immature muscle cell will eventually produce a mature full-size muscle cell. During this development of muscle some of the myoblasts remain in a pre-muscle um, uh, state and reside next to the muscle cells, and we call those satellite cells. These satellite cells become important for muscle repair. When muscle is damaged, these precursor cells can fuse with the mature muscle cell, providing their nuclear content and DNA to provide programming for the muscle repair or I should say additional programming. One of the reasons we think that skeletal muscle has 
a multiple nuclei distributed along its length is that because muscle is such a dynamic tissue, it does frequently get damaged. And because it gets frequently damaged, then it occasionally will have to undergo repair. And rather than to have, have a need to ship the proteins that are produced as part of the repair process from some distant nuclei, like you would have in a nerve fiber or a nerve cell, uh, where this nuclei can be distant from the part of the nerve that might be damaged. In the case of a muscle cell, no matter where it's damaged, there's always a nucleus in the vicinity, and that nucleus can then be activated to trigger repair processes. So here we have, in a mature muscle cell, we find um, these individual cells, they're in their connective tissue, uh, on the outside of that individual cell connective tissue, you'll find a few satellite cells. If we peek inside the muscle cell, what we see is something that reminds us of what we were looking at in the previous diagram with the fascicle. That is, the fascicle is packed with muscle cells, and if we move forward here, what we find is the muscle cell is packed with small fibers itself. Those fibers are called myofibrils. Myofibrils fill the cytoplasm of skeletal muscle cells, and they are the contractile machines that make muscle work. And when we look at the structure of the myofibril, what we see is a repeating pattern of protein filaments that are organized in a way that give rise to the striations that we saw under the microscope. So this repeating pattern of thick filaments shown here as part of a structure within the myofibril called a sarcomere and thin filaments, that repeating pattern gives us the appearance of the striations when we look under the microscope. The thick filaments are at the center of the structure called the sarcomere. The thin filaments go from the end of the sarcomere towards the center of the sarcomere from both sides, and the sarcomeric structure repeats along the length of the myofibril, so you have this repeating pattern of thick and thin filaments where the thick filaments are concentrated in the center of a sarcomere and the thin filaments are, are at the periphery. The border of the sarcomere is called the Z-disc or Z-line, and that is a protein structure that provides an anchoring position for those thin filaments, and we'll talk more about that later. Additionally, inside this muscle cell we see if the cell contains mitochondria, they are somewhat peripheral because the center or the, the breadth of the cytoplasm is filled with these myofibrils. Um, we see that the plasma membrane, which is shown in a light blue color, has some extensions which then go between the myofibrils and penetrate through the muscle cell. These are actually fluid-filled passageways containing extracellular fluid that go between the myofibrils through the entire muscle cell providing a mechanism for the movement of action potentials from the surface membrane through the center of the muscle cell, and we'll talk about this later. You'll also notice that adjacent to the extensions, these transverse tubules that go through the uh, muscle cell, there is another membrane system called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is a specialized smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and it is a calcium storage organelle. That calcium becomes important for the activation of muscle cells, and we'll talk about that more as we go through the process of how muscles activate and relax. Now this cartoon gives us a representation of some of the structures within a skeletal muscle cell. There are multiple nuclei, there are myofibrils, there can be mitochondrion, in red muscle cells, there's a protein called myoglobin, which is a hemoglobin analog, and it stores oxygen for red muscle cells, and so red muscle cells will have myoglobin. There are other muscle cells that don't have myoglobin, but they're likely to have glycogen, which is a storage form of glucose, and that will provide an energy source for those cells. Note that this cartoon also shows that the uh, myofibrils are linked to the muscle membrane by a protein called dystrophin. And dystrophin is the protein which uh, has a defect in a disease like Duchenne muscular dystrophy. 
Now what I don't like about this cartoon is that it shows the dystrophin connecting to the ends of the myofibrils and that's not the way it works. Dystrophin actually connects from the myofibrils at the level of the Z line to the uh, plasma membrane on the lateral portion of the uh, myofibril rather than at the end. So I just want to make that clear that the depiction of dystrophin linking towards the end of the myofibrils is incorrect. Other things to notice is the plasma membrane extends through the cell into these transverse tubular channels and the sarcoplasmic reticulum which is filled with calcium. As I said, it's a calcium storage organelle. I've jumped ahead too far. Let's go back, take another look at that sarcomeric structure. So in the center of a sarcomere, you have thick protein filaments. At the periphery of the sarcomere, you have thin protein filaments that are anchored to a Z-line. And then on the other side of the Z-line, there are thin filaments that project toward the center of the next sarcomere. This is a very ordered, regular structure. If we look in cross-section, what we see is that each of those thick filaments is surrounded by three, uh, six of the thin filaments, and each of the thin filaments is surrounded by three of the thick filaments, and we'll talk more about this later. Let's look a bit more in detail at the thick and thin filaments. The thick filaments are made of a protein called myosin, and myosin is a long alpha helical protein which is somewhat asymmetric. It has a long tail and a globular head domain, and it forms these filaments within the muscle fibers that are what we call bipolar because they have the cross bridge domains at either end, these globular domains which we'll call cross bridges at either end because they can link to the thin filaments, and they have a bare zone in the middle, and in the very middle there is a protein structure called the M line that links all of the thick filaments together. The thin filaments are made of a protein called actin, and actin uh, binds to the Z-disc and then extends toward the center, and it's a double-stranded, coiled, alpha helical structure. The individual actin molecules are globular, but when they uh, polymerize, they form this coiled, double-stranded, alpha helical structure. Also projecting from the uh, Z-line is a molecule called Titan. Titan has um, is a single molecule, it's not a polymer, it's a single molecule, attaches to the Z-line, spans the distance between the Z-line and the end of the thick filament, and then runs along the thick filament to the center. Titan molecules do not cross the center of the thick, uh, thick filament. They stop before they reach the M-line. When we describe a sarcomere, we can name certain areas of it and the area that contains the thick filaments is called the A-band. See, we can draw a line here. At the end of the thick filaments, that's called the A-band, and that leads to the dark pattern that we see in the striations of striated muscle. The period between the, the or the, the region between the end of the thick filament and the Z-line is called the I-band, and actually the I-band can extend to the edge of the thick filament in the adjacent sarcomere. So you have a repeating structure of I bands and A bands. And these are just terms that the anatomists assigned to these structures when they looked at them in the microscope before they had any idea of what the protein structures were. There is an area where the thick and thin filaments overlap, and so that's just a zone of overlap. The bare portion, which doesn't have cross bridges in the center, is called the H zone. And that's another feature to remember when you're looking at thick and thin filaments and their overlap in uh, a sarcomere. So let's look at these thick and thin filaments in cross-section. Remember we said that each uh, of the myosin filaments was surrounded by six actins, and each of the actin filaments was surrounded by three myosin thick filaments. And what we also see is if we look at the 
myosin thick filaments that they form a six-sided structure as well. So three, act three thick filaments around each thin filament, th six actin filaments around each thick filament in a hexagonal array, and because the myosin filaments also show hexagonal order, sometimes this is called a double hexagonal array. So it's a very crystalline structure and not something you would typically find in a biological tissue. Now, going back and looking at the longitudinal section, we can see here's an electron micrograph showing the structure of the sarcomere. Here's a Z line or a Z disc, the thin filaments projecting towards the center of the sarcomere, the titan filaments going towards the center of the sarcomere, and the thick filaments in the center, and then the M line where everything is tied together. Here is our cartoon description, and you can see that the people who have drawn the cartoon have paid very close attention to the electron micrograph. This knife is out of order because the knife would then give us the cross-section which we just looked at. Let's look at the myosin and actin. Myosin, as I said, is a long asymmetric protein with a long tail that is made up of a uh, coiled coil uh, structure. That is, one protein is wrapped around the other. You could say that the myosin molecule is a hexamer. That means it has six subunits. It has two heavy chains, which have the globular heads and the long alpha helical coiled coils, tails. And then they have four light chains. And the light chains here are smaller proteins that are associated with the globular portion of the myosin molecule. These uh, light chains become important, uh, and we'll talk about them more when we talk about the activation of smooth muscle. And the cartoon representation of where they are on the myosin globular domain or the myosin head is a little off. They both should be in the junction where the globular domain makes a transition to the long coiled coil domain. Also notice that the myosin heads or myosin cross bridge domains have actin binding sites so they can bind to the thin filaments and they have ATP binding sites which is an enzymatic site where ATP can be hydrolyzed and the energy from that hydrolysis can be used to power muscle contraction. Now below here we see uh, structure of the thin filament and you can see that it's made of this molecule called G-actin. G-actin is just a name that's assigned to an actin molecule when it's not forming a filament. When, my, when an actin molecule is on its own, an individual actin uh, molecule, it is called a G actin molecule. To fit, make a thick or thin filament, many, many G actin molecules will polymerize, and when they polymerize, they form this double stranded, coiled, alpha helically coiled thin filament. On each actin, within the thin filament you have a myosin binding site and it's re represented here by the black dot and you can see that the myosin binding sites are oriented so they uh, point outwards from the core of the thin filament and that allows myosin to find a uh, binding site no matter what the relative orientation of myosin is uh, to the thin filament. Now, we're not done with the thin filament. There are two regulatory proteins that are found on the thin filament uh, that are very important. One of them is tropomyosin, which is an alpha helical dimer. And they show it here as a single rod, but there's actually two strands, and they're wrapped around each other in a manner that's very similar to the way you would see the tails of myosin wrapped around each other. These tropomyosin molecules actually sit on top of the myosin binding sites on the actin thin filament when the muscle is at rest. And locking them in that position is a uh, protein called troponin, which has three subunits. Troponin has three, uh, the three subunits of troponin are troponin I, troponin T, and troponin C. These molecules together help to regulate contraction because troponin C is a calcium sensor.
and calcium will be the trigger to activate muscle contraction. So, you will have a calcium signal which will bind to troponin C and it will influence the position of tropomyosin so that tropomyosin can then move away from the myosin binding sites on the thin filament so that myosin can interact with actin and that's part of the activation process of skeletal muscle contraction. Now when tropomyosin moves off of the myosin binding sites it moves into this grooved area um, within the thin filament. So it moves away from the high radius outside of the thin filament more towards the core of the thin filament. Oh, one more thing. There's a stoichiometry of the binding of tropomyosin and troponin to the actin thin filament. There's one tropomyosin for each seven actin monomers and there's one troponin complex for each tropomyosin. So there's a regulatory unit on the thin filament that is seven actins, it spans seven actins of the thin filament. Other proteins within the sarcomere, we've already talked about Titan, it's a, a relative elastic, relatively elastic protein, and so that when muscles are stretched there is uh, tension taken up by the um, spring-like structures of the I-band for Titan that help to keep the M-line centered or, and the uh, thick filaments uh, centered in the sarcomere. Myomycin is a major protein of the M-line. There's a protein called nebulin. Nebulin runs parallel to the thin filaments and we've already talked about dystrophin which helps to link the Z-line to the plasma membrane. Now nebulin is an interesting protein because its length runs exactly the length of the thin filament and one of the questions has often been when uh, you have a small globular protein like actin and it polymerizes to form a filament what makes it stop at the right length for the sarcomeric structure of skeletal muscle? And it turns out that since nebulin is running adjacent to these thin filaments, the hypothesis put forward is that the length of nebulin is regulated by its genetic structure and the length of actin filaments is regulated by being assembled next to a nebulin filament so that when you reach the end of the nebulin filament you stop the um, polymerization of the actin thin filament. A similar role has been uh, ascribed to part of the Titan molecule because the Titan molecule runs along the thick filament and it changes its structure abruptly as it reaches the end of the thick filament and so it's possible that the length of the Titan also helps to genetically determine the length of the thick filament as well. Molecules that have that function are called molecular rulers because their length is determined by their genetic structure and, their, and that also determines the length of another structure which is um, a self-assembling polymerizing structure. So that's part of the hypothesis for how the sarcomeres ex is assembled to such exacting um, tolerances that everything is precisely aligned is that there are some molecular rulers in the structure that help to define how things should fit together. Now, I've discussed a lot of proteins and a lot of structures, and so you may want to try to think of how can I keep this information straight. And in a previous textbook we used, offered the idea of a flowchart. So here's an example of the flowchart that they used, and you can use a similar type structure if this is, con if this is something that works for you. So you have skeletal muscle that's made of fascicles, and the fascicles are made of individual muscle fibers. If you look at an individual muscle fiber, you have the membrane, which is the sarcolemma. We use the term sarco instead of plasma because sarco refers to flesh and muscle makes up most of our flesh. So sarcolemma, and the sarcolemma has a specialization called transverse tubules or T-tubules. The 
muscle fibers are filled with sarcoplasm or, my, uh, or myoplasm or cytoplasm. Those are all terms for the same um, fluid-like uh, environment of the inside of a muscle cell. And in that sarcoplasm, you will also find myofibrils, which are the contractile elements. You'll find the sarcoplasmic reticulum, multiple nuclei, mitochondria, and glycogen granules. Now the myofibrils are composed of sarcomeres, and the sarcomeres have these protein components, myosin, which makes the thick filaments, actin, which makes the thin filaments. The thin filaments also have troponin and tropomyosin. The thick filaments also have titan associated with them, as well as myomycin at the M line, and then nebulin is also associated with the thin filaments. The sarcomere is defined by the Z lines, which are made of alpha actinin and the Z-line connects to the sarcolemma via dystrophin. So this could be a useful way of putting it all together, but everyone has their own um, ways of organizing information. This is just one. Now let's talk about how muscle fibers contract and relax. When muscle fibers contract, the globular domains, the heads of myosin, will interact with the thin filaments and they will exert force on them from both sides of the sarcomere and pull the thin filaments towards the center of the sarcomere. And so you can see this depicted in the cartoon where as the contraction occurs the thin filaments slide towards the center of the sarcomere from both sides shortening each sarcomere and that's also shown on the right hand side here in an electron micrograph. And when that happens, it appears that the I-band gets smaller. Note the size of the I-band in the cartoon above compared to the I-band in the cartoon below. The I-band being defined as that space between the A-band in one sarcomere and the A-band in the next sarcomere with the Z-line in its center. As the contraction goes further, this I-band decreases. The A-band remains the same length because it's defined by the length of the thick filaments, but you have the thin filaments moving closer to the center. In a hypercontracted or maximal, this says maximally, I'd say this is hypercontracted system, you will find that the I bands are minimal, and in this case they're actually showing that thin filaments from one side of the sarcomere have gone through the M line and are protruding into the opposite side of the sarcomere and that would be an over-contraction of skeletal muscle. To contract a skeletal muscle requires ATP hydrolysis and a cyclic attachment of myosin to actin where a power stroke is executed to pull on the actin thin filament. In order to continue shortening, you will have to have then detachment of myosin from, of, from actin and repeating this cycle can cause more tension or more force developing events. Let's take a look at the cross bridge cycle. So here's the, the cartoon from the book, but I'm going to start here at step four rather than step one. This shows the thick filament with the myosin cross bridge, which has ATP bound in its uh, ATP binding site. And the thin filament in this cartoon has already bound calcium, which is the small pink sphere attached to the tropo, uh, troponin molecules, and the actin filaments have moved towards the center of the thin filament, so they are exposing the myosin binding sites on, the, on this thin filament. Now, ATP has to give up some energy in order for uh, it to power muscle contraction, so myosin hydrolyzes ATP to ADP and phosphate, and We'll continue this soon. Sorry, I had an interruption. I had to pause my recording, but I'm back and I will resume. So we were talking about the energizing of the myosin head because of hydrolysis. You hydrolyze ATP into ADP and phosphate. Note that in this cartoon they show that the ATP bound state the myosin head is bent, let's say at a 45 degree angle, and then after hydrolysis it is 
um, more upright at a 90 degree angle, this conformational change of the myosin molecule is storing energy from hydrolysis. And one of the things that myosin does that most enzymes don't do is it slowly releases its products. So if it um, hydrolyzes ADP and phosphate, or hydrolyzes ATP to ADP and phosphate, it doesn't release the products of hydrolysis immediately. It keeps them on board. This allows myosin to then wait until after it interacts with the actin thin filament to release its products and then couple the energy that it's stored in the change in conformation here into a power stroke that's actually going to make force to the release of the enzymatic products, ADP and phosphate. So we see the myosin uh, being charged with the hydrolysis of ATP uh, and then it can complete the power stroke. If you examined a muscle in the relaxed state, the myosin cross bridges would either have ATP or ADP and phosphate bound. And this is an important point. The slow release of products of ADP and phosphate allows myosin to charge with energy and store that energy for a relatively long period of time so that it doesn't waste energy in relaxed muscle. It's not constantly chewing up ATP going through this hydrolysis and then releasing the products and then binding ATP and hydrolyzing it again. It hydrolyzes ATP, it holds on to the products of the hydrolysis reaction, trapping them as it makes its conformational change, and in holding on to that state, myosin then uh, reduces the energy lost during muscle relaxation. But now let's talk about contraction. So calcium is bound to troponin so that the tropomyosin is not blocking the myosin binding sites on the thin filament. This charged myosin cross bridge can then bind to the actin thin filament and as it releases phosphate it begins its power stroke and this is um, shown here as these arrows which means that myosin is pulling the actin filament in that direction. Myosin is exerting force on the actin filament and it's going back from the 90 degree state that it was when it was charged to a more 45 degree orientation in the uncharged state. At the end of the power stroke, ADP is released, and when ADP is released, the active site on the myosin is now available so that ATP can rebind. And the ATP does an interesting thing. When ATP binds to the cross bridge after ADP is released, it actually reduces the affinity of the myosin cross bridge for the actin thin filament so that the myosin head can release from its power generating state by and with the binding of ATP and that allows other myosins to continue to slide the thin filament along while this myosin is recharging. The recharged myosin got ATP in its active site can then hydrolyze the ATP and as long as the calcium concentration is high it can complete this contraction cycle over and over again. When the calcium concentration is reduced, you go back into those states where either you have ATP bound and the affinity of myosin for actin is relatively low, or ADP and phosphate bound and the affinity of myosin for actin is still low and it's enforced that it stays in the relaxed state because the tropomyosin troponin will then reblock these uh, myosin binding sites on the thin filament in the relaxed muscles. Now a little bit about the neuromuscular junction. How do nerves signal to skeletal muscle cells? The connection between a motor neuron and a skeletal muscle cell is a synapse. Just like you have synapses between nerve cells and other nerve cells, you have a synapse between a nerve cell and a muscle cell. The nerve axon terminal releases acetylcholine and it is sitting across the synaptic cleft from a structure called the motor end plate. The motor end plate is a specialized region of the skeletal muscle cell which has receptors for acetylcholine. Acetylcholine receptors are ligand gated ion channels. You've learned about these before. Binding of acetylcholine to the muscle then triggers
an opening of that ligand gated ion channel and a local depolarization at the motor end plate which is called an end plate potential. The end plate potential is not the action potential, it is a graded potential. However, it can trigger an action potential and what does an action potential require? It requires voltage gated sodium and potassium channels. So the end plate potential, which is a local depolarization, can start to spread along the muscle cell membrane. When it encounters voltage gated sodium channels, they open to depolarize and start a at muscle action potential. And then that action potential starts to spread along the muscle cell membrane. And it uh, encounters populations of sodium channels and potassium channels along the muscle cell membrane that allow the action potential to travel the entire length of the muscle cell. So here's a picture of the neuromuscular junction. Here's an electron micrograph, a scanning electron micrograph showing a, a motor neuron axon, which is then splitting into these nerve terminals on the surfaces of the muscle cells. And you can see that the nerve terminal is highly specialized, and the muscle cell surface that the nerve terminal is sitting into is also fairly specialized. Um, in the picture on the right here, we show a cross section that shows the nerve terminal filled with acetylcholine vesicles and then the synaptic cleft and the motor end plate of the skeletal muscle cell. Here's another vision of it, another view of it showing the motor nerve axon, the muscle end plate, the vesicles with acetylcholine and the fusion zones, the active zones, where the vesicles will tend to bind to the post or presynaptic membrane to release their neurotransmitter. On the muscle cell membrane side, you will have concentrations of acetylcholine receptors to receive that signal. So there are many active zones, and the postsynaptic membrane has been infolded so to increase the surface area and allow you to have a higher concentration of acetylcholine receptors. An interesting point about the muscle action potential is it's not triggered from one end and then traveling to the opposite end. The neuromuscular junction or the motor end plate where the nerve and the muscle synapse is typically found in the center of the length of a muscle cell and when the action potential is fired, the, act, the electrical impulse travels in both directions simultaneously to activate the rest of the muscle cell. So we have activation at the neuromuscular junction and then spread of action potential bidirectionally towards the end of the muscle cell. The end plate potential only acts locally. The action potential spreads along the length of the muscle cell because sodium and potassium channels are distributed along the length of the plasma membrane. Just like a nerve muscle action potential, or nerve action potential, you will have a depolarizing phase due primarily to the voltage-gated sodium channels and a repolarizing phase that occurs after the sodium channels close and the voltage-gated potassium channels open. Look at the resting membrane potential. The resting membrane potential is, as you now know, dependent upon the concentrations of ions inside and outside of the um, cell. And in the case of muscle cells, the concentrations of ions inside might not be exactly the same as the concentrations of ions inside a nerve cell. So the resting membrane potential is not always minus 70. It can be at minus 90, it can be minus 85, it depends on the cell. You have to know those concentrations inside and outside in order to determine what the resting membrane potential will be. The process of excitation contraction coupling, the electrical signal, excitation, contraction, the development of force, begins like this. You have the uh, formation of an action potential in the muscle cell membrane and it travels through this, uh, the, along the muscle cell membrane through the transverse tubule networks and it will uh, then activate the system. In the relaxed case, all the calcium 
is within the sarcoplasmic reticulum and it's relatively low in the cytoplasm. The myosin and actin are weakly interacting but no force is generated and the tropomyosin is blocking the myosin binding sites on the thin filament. In contraction, when the action potential starts to travel along this membrane, it interacts with a protein in the transverse tubules that is called the dihydropyridine receptor. That's shown in blue here. The dihydropyridine receptor in most tissues, or in most cells, is a voltage-gated calcium channel, but that's not what it's doing here. When a voltage-gated channel opens, what it's doing is changing its shape. And when the dihydropyridine receptor in skeletal muscle encounters the action potential for the muscle cell, it changes its shape. And the shape change or movement of the dihydropyridine receptor changes its association with the calcium release channel of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is also called the ryanidine receptor. Let's go back and look at the relaxed state again. And you see that the dihydropyridine receptor and the ryanidine receptor are in very close contact. When the action potential passes through the plasma membrane in the transverse tubules, it allows the release channel from the sarcoplasmic reticulum to open. And the concentration of calcium is extremely high within the sarcoplasmic reticulum extremely low within the cytoplasm and calcium rapidly goes out of the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm binding to troponin on the thin filament and then tropomyosin can move away from those minding, myosin binding sites on the thin filament. This allows the myosin which already has ADP and phosphate bound to it to bind to those sites and begin the force generating process. Here is a summary of the entire process, starting with a nerve action potential, which then causes release of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. That acetylcholine binds to acetylcholine receptors on the end plates of the muscle cell, allowing that ion channel to open and cause a local depolarization, which then triggers a muscle cell action potential due to the opening of voltage-gated sodium channels on the muscle cell membrane. That action potential travels through that sarcolemma into the transverse tubular network and interacts with the dihydropyridine receptor where it then can stimulate the release of calcium by disassociating the dihydropyridine receptor and the ryanidine receptor which is the calcium release channel. Calcium flows down its concentration gradient into the cytoplasm, binding to the thin filament and removing the inhibition of troponin and tropomyosin on the thin filament. This allows myosin to bind to actin and use the energy of ATP hydrolysis to pull on the actin filaments, shortening the sarcomere, generating force. And this continues to happen as long as the calcium concentration is high. If the nerve action potentials don't continue, that means that there is no more release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and that the calcium pumps in the sarcoplasmic reticulum can start to reaccumulate calcium from the cytoplasm and they pump the calcium concentration down to levels where it will release from the thin filaments and then tropomyosin will reblock those sites on the thin filament so myosin cannot produce force and the muscle will relax. There's an animation that you can run by clicking this link. Thank you for your attention.